Welcome to the Muscle Expert Podcast with Ben Pakulski, one of the world's top professional bodybuilders, an expert on human performance and mindset mastery. Ben dives deep to deliver the strategies of the top experts to upgrade your body, mind, muscle, strength, performance, biochemistry, and how to become the upgraded modern man. Join us on benpokolsky.com to learn the cutting edge techniques to take control of your body, your brain, and create your greatest life. Hey, on today's podcast, we're going to give you insights into the mindset and habits of two extremely successful professional football players. Steve Weatherford and Grant Ziak have started a business to help inspire men and women around the world to master their mind, master their body, and really just become great human beings. And I think that's one thing that's missing in the fitness industry, and all of you might agree that we need more leaders, we need more good people. And um, that, although that may sound underwhelming, this podcast is definitely not. We go really deep on some of the skills, some of the obstacles, some of the habits necessary to really become your greatest self. And you guys are going to like this a lot. Uh, we also dive into some, some daily routines um, and just some of the insights into how these guys have become great leaders and maintain that positive, inspirational attitude every single day. Um, Steve gives us a really golden nugget as to how he approaches his nighttime routine and this one thing he does to set his unconscious mind in the perfect state for success every day when he goes to bed. So don't miss this episode. All right, ladies and gents, the Muscle Expert Podcast. I've got two badasses here in my office today, and we're not going to discuss muscle. We're going to discuss how to become a great human being. And Steve Weatherford and Grant Ziak are here to talk about how they wake up every single day and motivate themselves not just to get shit done, but to be great men, to lead, inspire, and crush it in their lives and everything they do. So these guys are building a business. Steve Weatherford is a world... Uh, Super Bowl champion, uh, Grant, we just finished a workout. He's an all-around badass and a great human being. And this is all about inspiring you guys to get your ass out of bed, stop making excuses about your life and feeling sorry for yourself and really start attacking things. So, man, Steve, how do you – first of all, actually, why don't we talk about um, – where you came from, man. Like, so nobody knows anything about your history. Let's assume, um, you know, people don't know a lot about your history. Steve, for you guys that don't know, is a small town farming boy and uh, won the Super Bowl in what year, Steve? 2012. 2012, the New York Giants. Let's talk about your history, man. You grew up in a small town. You actually were telling me about getting arrested at 12 and, and how that influenced your life. Let's talk about that stuff. Yeah, um, you know, I've had kind of an interesting journey to, to where I'm at right now. And, and I think kind of I don't want to call it humble, humble beginnings, but I always had food, I always had shoes, I always had clothes, I always had a roof over my head, and I always had great parents. And the important things I had, but like genetics, um, having awesome coaches, I didn't have a lot of the benefits that a lot of people have. But one thing uh, that I I earned very very early on, um, I earned the the opportunity to to work with a lot of insanely influential people that that knew a lot about what I wanted to become the best at and the way that I was able to earn that was just providing support to them and showing them that no matter what no matter what I lacked in in intelligence or genetics or ability or athleticism I was going to make up for it with just working hard and um, and to go from 108 pounds as a freshman in high school and have massive dreams and aspirations and, and it literally wasn't until this month that we're in right now, November, that I was, ab- I was able to achieve the last goal that I had set for myself when, when I was in high school. I was 14 years old, and uh, the first time I ever picked up a Muscle & Fitness magazine, I'm like, that's what I need to do. I wanted to be a pro athlete. I wanted to be an Olympic champion. I wanted to start a family, uh, and I wanted to be on the cover of the magazine that like started my infatuation with health, wellness, performance, and just really optimizing my genetic potential. And and that was really the only kind of resource that I had that in the library. Right. And in Terre Haute, Indiana, it wasn't like they had like tons of. Um, I think the only book they really had on actual weight training performance was uh, the bodybuilding encyclopedia. And as you know, (laughs) I learned a lot about muscles and their function, but it's a total, it's a totally different beast, bodybuilding and athletic performance. 
And so yeah. I learned a lot about the, the, the body and, and physiology and, and how to eat and how to make a muscle grow, but actual act, athletic performance, I didn't have any resources. And so muscle and fitness was, was it for me. And to be on the cover of that this month is like the last bucket list thing I had from when I was a kid, but you continually, and as you know, you know, you achieve goals and then you recalibrate and you set new ones. So, um, it's probably going to be another 20 years before I achieve the goals that I have right now. But just to look back on the goals that I had, how huge they were. Yeah. Now, granted, I was an Olympic champion, but I was a world champion. So technically, technicality, I can check all those off. Sure. But uh, just super fortunate, super blessed that I stayed healthy and uh, stayed humbled. And, and I maintained that the reason that I was able to get a college scholarship and play professionally and, and meet all the influential people that I've met up until this point, including you. And I've, I've sponged information and, and advice and mentoring off of all of them. And that's kind of like what I am today is a culmination of so many different investments from so many different people, from so many different walks of life, right. not just athletically, not just nutritionally, not just mentally, spiritually, emotionally. It's, it's everybody that I've met has something to, to offer. Man, a lot of people out there are listening to what you're saying, and they're making excuses as to why they can't achieve what they're trying to achieve. So one of the things you said was, man, I, I didn't have the genetics, I didn't have the coaching, but all I knew was I'm going to work hard and I'm going to achieve whatever it is I set out to achieve. And talk about um, how you knew in your mind that, that hard work would get you there and how you refused to make excuses for all those things that you could have very well made excuses for as to why you can't do it. Well, my, my grandfather, I remember the conversation like it was yesterday, 12 years old, and, and I was really upset after a basketball tournament that, um, you know, my family uh, and myself drove like three hours, and it was I was playing on a very competitive travel basketball team, and when I was 12, I was above average athleticism, but, I mean, I think when I was 12, I was 5'3 and... 90 pounds maybe I don't remember exactly what my weight was but at 14 I was one away so do the math and we played three games and I never touched the the court you know it was just it's not really embarrassing uh it was disheartening because I knew I worked harder than every single person on my team but due to my size and my lack of strength athleticism just wasn't enough and so I knew um being that upset something had to change because I didn't want to live the rest of my life feeling like it doesn't matter how hard I try. I'm, I'm never going to be to achieve what I want to achieve. And I just wanted to play. So what, you was, know it, what, I mean? what was the need to change? So my, uh, my grandfather told me, you know, I was upset riding home on, on a three hour drive after literally just being a cheerleader for my teammates. And he said, you know, there's so many things in life that you can't control, but if you can control these two things, it doesn't matter what your goal is, you're going to achieve it. It might take you longer than Bobby or, you know, Billy, but you're going to get there, I guarantee you. And it's attitude and effort. And if you show up every single day with a positive attitude, encouraging others, lifting others, the funny thing happens in the universe that you end up getting elevated as well because of the, I don't even want to say karma and I don't want to talk yoga or any of that stuff, but there's something that happens in your brain when you bless other people with, with optimism or positivity or encouragement or just support and letting somebody know it could be a parking attendant or a janitor. When you let them know that their opinion matters, that their life matters, that you know that you appreciate them for what they are and who they are. Sure. Something weird happens in your brain that you get a sense of of happiness as well when you continually pour your happiness into others. You don't run out of happiness. It actually ends up exponentially filling up your own bucket you, of happiness. You can't get discouraged. You can't be pissed off when you're trying to lift other people up. Yeah. That's just the reality. That's probably one of the best um, things I've ever heard. And, you know, you've got five kids, and I want to hear what, how you, you teach your kids those similar lessons. But first, Grant, um, talk about that similar thing, man. Obviously, you're a successful guy. you got a great physique. Um, what, at what point in your life did it become uh, or did you realize that, you know, you can kind of accomplish anything, like the the idea of, you know, working hard, what was your um, maybe catalyst or what was your kind of the moment that you realized in your life that anything is possible for you? Well, I had a lot similar upbringing as, you know, Steve, and I think that's why he and I connect so well. We, uh, I never really had any wants when I was younger, but uh, my mother worked day and night to provide for that. Uh, and I had to watch that firsthand all day, every day. But my biggest goal was when I was younger, I wanted to go play football at Ohio State and I came from a really small town. We were, I think we were one of the worst, absolute worst teams in the state, actually, record-wise. 
Um, so getting recruited was a little bit difficult, and there really wasn't anyone else in my city. Um, it w wasn't a big city of where there was a ton of dreams and a lot of like templates out there for how to achieve things. So kind of having goals and dreams and aspirations of getting out was, um, you, were, you kind of became the outcast. So throughout, isn't that the reality always though? It right? really is. Yep. And, <clears throat> but watching my mom growing up, uh, you know, I learned from a young age that, you know, you just kind of got to grind it out and put your head down and be humble and learn from all those around you. So while I was going through this whole process of everyone telling me it wasn't going to happen, that it was impossible and that I was crazy. Uh, you know, I learned from that. I learned how other people are. And I think it really, you know, in the long run, it's given me a, a good idea for how to read people and work with people. Um, but when I got there, I had a bunch of setbacks. It seemed like it was one thing after the other. And I remember at one point, finally, I hit a point where uh, I was getting up. It was like 5 a.m. in the morning, and I was so tired. And I, was, I started to ask myself almost, like, why am I still doing this? Like, what is my purpose? Like, why am I killing myself to, to do this goal that nobody thinks I can achieve? Like, maybe I'm the crazy one. And I had a very close relationship with my grandmother growing up. And she, I, so she called me every morning to wake me up to get me out of bed. And I didn't really need it. It was just an opportunity for us to talk. But she called me one morning. And while I was doubting myself, I was like, you know, what are you up to? And she's on her way to therapy. And she was on her way to therapy to get her, she got her knees replaced so that in college she could come watch me play football. Um, and she did that because she couldn't go to my away games in high school. So I had my grandmother, who at the time was 75 years old, getting two knee surgeries, thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars, lots of therapy, lots of hours, just so she could walk down and watch me play football. And in that one moment, I realized that you had to find a purpose outside of yourself. And it, for me, it was my grandmother. So, um, you know, no matter how many people were doubting me, no matter how much it seemed like all the odds were stacked up against me, I had a purpose outside of myself because... You know, you hear it all the time that you, you can't quit on yourself, but it's like if you have another driving force outside of that, you know, you can't let them down, essentially. So that that's kind of what did it for me. And, and that moment when I realized I had that, there, there was nothing I could stand in my way. Steve, obviously as a pro athlete, there's a lot of sacrifices you have to make, man. What are some of the things that you recall um, having to sacrifice? And more importantly, why you chose to make those sacrifices to be to get to where you did? I know we all give things up and we all... You know, everyone in day-to-day -day life fights those battles with themselves of like, should I do this or should I do that? And inevitably, I'm sure you made a lot of the right choices. Maybe we've made some wrong choices along the way, but um, speaking about, you know, how you overcame the uh, desire to be lazy. Um, man, that's a, that's a good question. And I couldn't tell you exactly the point that, that it really kind of became very, very clear to me when not to be lazy because growing up in the Midwest – like it, if you were lazy, it was almost kind of like you were the outcast, you were the anomaly, and you were the person that people looked at like, oh, what a bum. Right. But it had nothing to do with deciding to be lazy or it, it was positive peer pressure. Because when you're around people that work, you know, 60 hour weeks and then go home and, and are still, you know, a righteous father and, and husband, I grew up around that. You know, I had a great dad. I had, you know great grandfathers. I had great mentors in my life that were good people. Were they uber high achievers? No, because that's that's not something that really in the Midwest, for the most part, you know, it's not everybody, but people don't see past their, their city limits. And, and it was, I was able to take the work ethic that was instilled in me, kind of the Midwest blue collar roots, and couple that with with a big vision way outside of my city city limits way outside of my country you know i wanted to impact impact people so much on on such a deeper level than just hey you know watch me play football and be inspired or hey watch me lift weights and be inspired it was i wanted to connect with people on on an emotional level and that's why after 10 years in the nfl like i decided to leave not you know not necessarily i wasn't healthy enough or I couldn't perform at a high enough level, it was about what was truly going to fulfill me and my life and something I wanted to look back on when I'm 70, 80, 90 years old and, and hang my hat on. I don't want to hang my hat on being Super Bowl champion. I don't want to hang my hat on playing 10 years in the NFL. That was what I did, not who I am. And now I'm trying my best to leverage that and take the, the NFL career that I had and utilize it as a conduit to be able to reach, teach, inspire, and, and empower, and, and educate people on you're not that far away from what you, your, your true 
calling is in life. And every, every single person has a gift. And really, the, the mission every day shouldn't be make money, feed my family. It's find your purpose, become obsessed with it, give yourself to it, and, and find a way to make that purpose a career. A lot of people listening are making excuses for themselves as to maybe not having the great dad and not maybe having the great role model. And the reason that Steve and Grant are on the show, guys, is because these guys are gr fucking great human beings who have amazing energy. And that's what I want you guys to feel. And that's what I want you guys to experience at home. And if you're looking for someone to look up to as to how to act as a human being, how to act as an athlete, how to act as a dad or a businessman, these are your guys. And this is, so for anyone sitting at home right now feeling sorry for yourself because someone has grown up with something that you haven't, put yourself in, in, in a different set of shoes and realize that making excuses is never gonna get you anywhere. There's mentors out there for everybody and that's why these guys are here. Uh, so for those of you that aren't already following Steve and Grant, uh, Steve Weatherford is weatherford5.com uh, and, and Grant is his right hand man. Um, Talk about what you guys are doing as far as empowering young men, because this is cool to me. This is why we connected, man, because, you know, we realize that the fitness industry is probably the most screwed up of all because it attracts people. There's no probably about it. It yeah, is for sure. Because it attracts the type of people who think that building muscle will change who they are or or that something about, you know, being big will make them more confident or have less fear. Um, it's no, like you say, no question, it's the most messed up industry. And, and you guys are doing something that's going to transcend the muscle. You know, you're teaching people to build muscle, but more importantly, you're teaching them the why behind the building muscle, um, why it's going to make them a better person, How and, and you're inspiring people. So t talk about your mission, man. Like, what is what is your vision, and, um, you know, who are you trying to impact, and how do you plan on doing it? Um, for us, collectively, and one of the reasons that, that I decided, um, I made the decision about six weeks ago, um, to, to offer Grant an opportunity to kind of leave what he's working on right now, which, you know, he's, he's successful at it. But with his skill set and, more importantly, his integrity and, and the fact that we share the same vision and, and the same kind of life purpose is we want to use the – we want to use fitness. We want to use nutrition. We want to use wellness the same way that I used the NFL to build my brand and kind of attract people into my ecosystem with – you know, either training programs or, or motivation or education or entertainment. And then once I have them into my ecosystem, then I can truly engage with them because I think the most valuable thing I can ever ask of anybody else on this planet is for their attention mm -hmm. because that's the one thing that we can never get more of. You know, you can never get more time in a day. Right. And so the amount of work that you do in a day, the amount of work that Dr. Oz does a day, then the amount of work that Michael Strahan does in a day is just consistently more than what other people are doing. Michael Strahan is no more talented on TV than other people are, but he works his craft. You know, he's a, he's a master of nurturing relationships and he does things the right way. And it's the same thing with Dr. Oz. And it's the same thing with the other influential people in my life, like yourself. You know, I, I looked up to you um, as a source of kind of crusading in the fitness and wellness industry because you were doing it the way that you thought it should be done, not the way that you thought was going to get the most likes on Instagram or the most shares on Twitter. You did it because it came from a place of, of authenticity and your self-awareness is enabling you to kind of look at yourself in the mirror and find the different tools that you have utilized to, to help you find success in bodybuilding, help you find success as an entrepreneur, help you find success as a husband and a father. And you're essentially leveraging the different social media platforms like podcasts, YouTube, right. Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, all those different platforms that you're utilizing. But you have a mission. You're not just trying to get likes and right. trying to get comments. And that's what that's what attracted me to you initially and then actually having conversations with you and, and seeing how deeply you think about life not muscle building not nutrition everything you know like it's it's all inclusive and and that's what i want to do i want to attract people into our ecosystem yeah. with a certain thing but i want to give them so so much more right grant what's your vision man what do you want to do what do you bring to the table that inspires you to be the greatest version of yourself um well i'd say like growing up i was pretty typical. I was 
uh, I didn't understand supplementation. I didn't understand nutrition or really the fitness industry. I saw, you know, I'd see magazines and I'd see fat burners and this. And I was, I was like a perfect victim of, let me take a fat burner, sit on this couch and eat pizza all day. And I think that's going to counterbalance it. Or It does, doesn't it? Right. I, I, I think so. <laughs> Pretty much now it does. As long as you're in Florida and we're sweating like yeah, this. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I was a victim to all those things. I did those. I had bought the programs when I was younger. I was the one who would see the infomercials when I was younger and think, man, this is going to change my life. Like, I'm going to get this ab chair with a roller on the back and I'm going to be happy. And... I realize it, realize it has nothing to do with that. And, right. and now flash forward, you know, 15, 20 years later, and I've, I've come so far from realizing that that has nothing to do with it. And being a trainer and being a personal trainer, it's, it's been awesome to work with, you know, old, young, male, female, a little bit of everything. And what I realize is we all have insecurities, everyone across the board. And so many people mask them. And a lot of men mask them with, let me get big muscles. Let me, let me get as big and dominant looking as I can but you're still left with the insecurities at the end of the day. So what I love to do is to tap into the insecurities I felt when I was younger and then reach people on a personal level. Um, I love the training, but I, I, it wasn't, it was probably a year into it. And I realized I, it was for me, it wasn't that I loved telling you how many sets and reps to do. It's that I had a platform that I could reach people. I could, I could find out their problems. I could find out what was wrong with them. And then I could kind of take my life experience and express it to them and then kind of expedite them through their process and their struggles. Talk about that, man. What, what are some of the insecurities that you feel you're able to overcome and how you did it? Because there's a lot of people out there, like we talked about when we were training, we just finished a workout and we were talking about the idea of people think that building muscle is going to change something for them. But when we know it's not, but what will change something for you is the person you become in the process, the discipline, the sacrifice, the avoiding the desire to be lazy, like we talked to Steve about. So maybe just talk about one of your biggest insecurities or, or one of the, the ways you just have become a more confident, more secure man. Right. Well, and it's, it's awesome because last night we were actually talking about the process. Yeah. Everything is a process. And, um, it's, you know, it became not the destination of having a six pack and, you know, ripped arms and, you know, big legs and all this stuff, you know, it, it became the process and mm-hmm. what I learned along the way. So I'd say the number one insecurity I overcame was essentially just being myself and not that I had to become a character, not that I had to build this superhuman like physique or personality to be something different. Like who I was, was good enough. And it's not that I was settling. It's that what I was was already extraordinary and what you are is already extraordinary. And you realize that everyone just kind of like shelters it down. And, you know, you have all these different personalities all around that some are super outgoing and you can see those personalities and people that are a little bit more maybe introvert. Um, they, they kind of withhold, they, they hold it back and they don't let their personality come out. So because of that, they think they're less. And I think that's probably the number one thing I, I've gotten out of all this is that through this platform of being able to help people, and seeing the change it makes, when you can impact someone, you realize what your voice is, what your experience is, and who you are really does make a difference. And that alone and in itself, I think, I mean, by default, you just kind of get over that fear and get over that insecurity. I love that you brought up the process, man, because, you know, I always say that I'm the king of the process, and I want people at home to realize that change doesn't happen overnight, like you speak about the process. The process of change is one step at a time, one foot in front of the other. And all you got to do is take a step in the right direction because you'll wake up one day and you go, holy shit, I'm actually a much better person than I used to be or a much better person than I thought I was. And uh, just because you, you've, you've placed more emphasis and attention on the process rather than on where you're trying to go, because if you're thinking about where you're trying to go, I mean, maybe you can get there, but uh, sometimes it's a daunting task, it's overwhelming, and you end up failing, right? You end up uh, setting yourself up for failure. Uh, Steve, what do you hope to do um, as far as, you, you know, you spoke about what it's going to look like having a big dream. What's it going to look like in 25 years for Steve Weatherford and uh, Grant Ziak? You know, I, I, it's going to change because the goal that I had a year ago is is different than the goal that I have now. But I think that's the fun part. Like that's Who the journey helping? of life. Because I'm so good. This is what ninety five percent of the world. Because I don't want to make the five percent perfect more fit. In what way? I want. I want to. I want the people. The ninety five percent of society. The ninety five percent of people that are on this planet. They're that are a little bit overwhelmed or they're. They're master excuse makers because yeah. that that's our 
our human nature is the path of least resistance. You know, we're talking about this morning in the weight room, a conversation Ben and I had was about how the weight room is really just a metaphor for life. So if I see somebody walk into uh, a restaurant that I'm in and they walk in and they're really well dressed and they're, and they're well put together and they're, you know, their hygiene's on point, their hair is done and they look like they're very fit. Instantly, I can tell several things about that person and that's one of the reasons I, I enjoy being elite fit, if you can call it that, yeah. because when I walk into a room, I don't, even if like, for whatever reason, people, you know, I'm not in New York, because that's really the only place that I get recognized a lot. <laughs> like when I'm out in California, uh, I don't get recognized that much, which is kind of refreshing. Yeah. Um, I can kind of go about my business and I love to, when people stop me for pictures, so I don't want to come off that way, but to be kind of a nobody on the on the West Coast, unless they're a Giants fan, to be a nobody, it gives me the opportunity to to work on my own social skills and, and notice what people notice about me without me opening my mouth. And when you walk in and you're well put together and you're fit and you, you walk with good posture and you're, you're carrying yourself well, that says so many different things about you without you opening your mouth. And that's one of the things that attracted me to fitness was seeing somebody that was super fit, they always looked confident to me. Yeah. And so I don't think I struggled with self-confidence, but I did struggle with believing I belonged. Like even during my entire 10 year NFL career, I was puking 10 minutes before every single game I played. And, and it wasn't that I didn't believe in myself, it's that I worked so hard to get to that point and it meant so much to me I wasn't a nervous wreck, but the performance anxiety was so high because I had so much invested. And so for people that are overwhelmed, you know, we talked about the 95%, they're overwhelmed because they don't know where to start. And so we're talking about self-worth, we're talking about self-confidence, we're talking about overcoming things that were huge hurdles for us, becoming the best versions of our, ourselves. And I am so far away from where I want to be, and it's it's you do TV interviews or podcast interviews and you speak and people have nice things to say about you based upon your achievements. But my achievements aren't, that's not me. That's like a reflection of my hard work and people that have invested into me. Mm -hmm. And if I'm able to, you know, completely change a part of my physique based upon the knowledge that you dropped on me this morning, that's partly your success as well. So I think sure. surrounding yourself with positive people and people that truly, truly want to see you succeed and achieve when you surround yourself with people like that, you can't lose because even when you get knocked down and you're vigilant with your mentality, to be able to surround yourself with people that are gonna assist you in getting back up, dusting you off and, and, and encouraging you back on your path, that's what life is about. So, so it's not the, about achievements, it's about surrounding yourself with people that wanna see you win. Right, so what's the, most of our listeners are obviously maybe a little further along than being the bottom of the barrel, but so what's the first step for people? Do you think it's if it's like fitness, is it? changing your self-confidence is it is no it? mental conditioning i think the first place every single person should start and i don't care if you're president of the united states or the prime minister of canada or you're a janitor mental conditioning will will predict your success a hundred times before Tell me what that means talking about that M mental conditioning it, and it's not just toughness it's also kindness it's no. also thoughtfulness it's also um, the ability to control your perspective because things are going to happen to every single person listening to this podcast right now. Like things happened to us yesterday when we were trying to catch our flight and my wife booked Running our tickets to come up. down here <laughs> and she spelled Grant's um, last name incorrectly. Uh, and it would have been really easy for me to pick up the phone and like MF my wife up and down, you know what I mean? Because I was so frustrated because right. I was excited uh, to come down here and right. I didn't know if there were any other flights and for me to possibly miss an opportunity to come down here and you volunteer your time and, uh, you know, not just to do the podcast, but honestly, just to jam out and for yeah. me to kind of like peel back the layers of you and, and find out like, is this guy really what I think he is? Because right now, like he's, you know, he's a freaking righteous person and not because you have big arms or, you know, Mr. It's Olympia cast, this or yeah. that, you know, it's just, it's everything that you've built as your achievement, but also the fact that, you know, I mean, I think that the first day you and I hung out at Bedros's mastermind, we, it was a, it was a different connection, you know, and I think on paper, 
the way you left bodybuilding and the way I left the NFL, very, very similar, but our personalities are completely different. Right. I'm a compulsive ADHD, complete spaz, and you're, <laughs> you're kind of the guy that sits and assesses his environment and we'll think about what he's gonna say for five minutes, whereas like literally the second it pops into my my mind, I vomit it out, you know? So it's it's funny to see somebody reach the pinnacle of their industry, I reached the pinnacle of my industry, we both exited before our time, but I think a lot of the common denominators that you and I have is we love the process. Like I love trying something new and getting outside of my comfort zone to, to grow as a person not just grow my muscles. So the mental conditioning to me is is the number one predictor of personal, financial, relationship, and and fitness success. So I'm I'm a big um, proponent of the saying that your struggles develop your character. You know, when you see an obstacle, run head first because that's your greatest opportunity for growth. Tell me about the biggest obstacle you face in your life, man, and when you thought you were going to fail, and you. you overcame it and potentially if it became one of your part of your character it's a long story but i'm going to give it to you in two minutes sure man uh i'm in my third year in the nfl and like i said earlier like i never thought that i like deserved to be in the nfl the first day that i walked into the locker room um for the new orleans saints my locker i was number seven my locker was in between number nine and number five and then when i looked at the name next to the next to the numbers that were next to me, it was Reggie Bush and Drew Brees. And I'm thinking to myself, I already didn't feel like I belong here. And now I'm sandwiched in between a Super Bowl champion and an Heisman Trophy winner. Right. Like, I don't, I don't think I, I belong here. But I knew, I knew I earned the opportunity to be there, but I didn't feel like I was good enough to be there. But that never changed. Like, even now, uh, I am an uber-confident person and even even to the degree of, of almost arrogance, but I, and you know, in order to become the best in the world at what you do, you have to have almost like a facade of, of confidence. You can't doubt yourself right. for a second. You know, so yeah. it's uh, humble enough to prepare, but confident enough to perform. Yeah. And, Beautiful. and I don't want to say I Put mastered that. that. Grant. I don't want to say I mastered that, but that, that's sure. what I hang my hat on. Dude, I hang my hat on being the hardest worker in the room. If you doubt yourself for a second, you're... Where my confidence comes... Yeah. Is, is the fact that I know I can go out and play in the Super Bowl in front of 72 million people and just let it rip. You know, I still have performance anxiety because I have so much invested into it, but I know when I go out there and I get the ball in my hands, I know I did every single thing that I needed to to prepare myself emotionally, spiritually, mentally, and physically. So if I do fail, I know it just, I wasn't good enough, and I'm okay with that. I don't ever want to fail and let the reason be something that I could have controlled, a.k.a. preparation. Didn't practice enough. Yep. Cool, man. So you're talking about that being um, one of the times when you maybe felt inadequate standing beside Reggie and, and yeah. Drew Brees. Yeah, so to go back to that story, getting cut and having all of those things taken away from me in my third season, yep. to have all, everything, literally, the rug pulled out from underneath you and say, and the coach says, you know, we're, we're going to go in a different direction. And that was just code word for you're not good enough. Right. It was, it was a humbling experience, but I, I was able to, to use that to look back on what I had and, and think to myself, that was an amazing achievement, but I have more in the tank. I have more that I need to prove to myself. And it's not necessarily getting back into the NFL, but it's proving to myself that that coach is wrong. All those other people are wrong. I'm going to do the only thing I know how to do. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to over-prepare. And then when I do have my opportunity to go back out there and, and earn my spot in the NFL, I was ready for it because I didn't let that adversity, I didn't let the opinion of someone else give me my identity. My identity is what I form of myself, and I'm able to have the confidence and borderline arrogance because I know I did everything up until this point to prepare myself for the opportunity. Grant, what's the hardest thing you've ever done? Um, it's like, really, I, I, like something, something that really tested you as a man, man, that made you take your balls out and, and swing, around, swing around like a flag of, of honor, right, like a badge of honor. Um, I'd kind of say the overall... Uh, concept of getting getting to Ohio State, yeah. getting getting to that next level. 
Um, Hell yeah, man. That's, that's not an easy thing to do, man. You know, when I, when I got there, I'm looking around at all these guys, and I was, you know, it, it's so weird going into it because I guess I was like a fanboy, yeah. you know. Um, and I remember, you know, my very first day walking up after I made the team, uh, James Laurinaitis walks up to me. And he's like, you know, who are you? And I'm like, you know, I'm Grant. I just made the team. And he's like, oh, sweet man, gave me a big hug. He said, yeah, welcome. Who is he, a coach or James? Yeah. Uh, he plays for the Rams uh, right okay. now. Yeah. Amazing linebacker. So he was on the team. Yeah. Okay. So uh, he was in his junior year. So I'd already watched him play and perform. And you know, I, I knew probably all of his stats. And right. I love the fact that Ben knows nothing about football. I actually, the, to me, that's attractive. You know what I mean? Man, I like, I don't that. even want to come in here and, like, talk about football because I don't like football. So when he's like, who's James Laurinaitis? I'm like, that's kind of refreshing. You know what I mean? I haven't had a TV in almost 10 years now. No, anymore, that's, so. that's I'm definitely that's nice. behind the time. I don't want to talk about football anyway, you know. But, uh, you know, I think, I think overcoming all that and then be able to see a full picture of – you know, I worked so hard to get there, and then you get there, and it's almost like going behind the scenes at Disney World. You went, once you get back there, you realize, okay, this is mechanical. This is this. This is how this actually works. This is where the TV spotlights go, and you kind of see the whole production side of it. And it's surreal, isn't it? it? It's surreal, and it's amazing. And at the same time, through all that struggle to get there and overcome that, to only realize on the other side that we're all people. Um, you know, these people that I, I looked up to and I was like, oh, you're a superhero. I'm, at the end of the day, you are still a person at the core. And again, back to insecurities, you have the ins same insecurities that I do. We're, we're, we're so like-minded. So what that does is it takes the struggle and it made me kind of change my outlook on struggle. And that's why I think I struggled for a second <laughs> to, to answer that initially because I don't look at much like a struggle anymore. No matter right. what it is, it's, it's, again, it's part of that process. And, you know, whether it's, making a football team. And, and one of the biggest things that I compare struggles to with people in human growth and development is uh, relationships. Um, you know, you break up with somebody, you know, you spend those two, three, four, five weeks, maybe even longer, you know, on your couch, you wake up every morning. You can't even breathe when you wake up in the morning because it hurts so bad. And, you know, you don't, you, you can't picture your life any other way. And, you know, flash forward a couple months, retrospect, it, it was a blessing in disguise. Right. Um, you know, one way or another because it led you to where you are now. And one of the biggest things that ever happened to me was going through a, a bad breakup. And, you know, a couple months down the road, I was, I was looking back. I'm like, man, that was actually the best time of my life because I learned so much about myself. Transfer that to the weight room, big adversity equals big growth. Yeah. Uh, transfer to any other thing, you don't grow unless you, you have to overcome something. I'll ask both of you guys this. Both of you have been around some of the best athletes ever in the history of, of sport. Um, what sets apart the guys who are absolutely world-class, the guys who are outstanding? Obviously, you're all, everyone in, that, all in the locker rooms are excellent, right? They're ama amazing at what they do. Now, what sets apart the guys who just take it to that whole different level? It's, it's routine. I think it's, it's the ritualistic lifestyle of, of having a plan and then consistently executing it. You know, I'd, referenced uh, Drew Brees um, a few minutes ago, but he's like five foot 11. You know, I mean, he's got several NFL passing records, most touchdowns in a season and most passing yards in a season over a 10 year period. Just what so are you saying about someone who's five foot 11, man? I'm just saying, like, you should, <laughs> when you're trying to pass the ball over people that are six foot seven, <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> it's a little bit of a diversity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what, just to watch his process of he's always consistently the first person in the building and always consistently the last person to leave the, the building. And I talk about, you know, oh, I didn't have that much talent or I, you know, my genetics. He has achieved triple what I achieved during my pro career. He's still playing and he had way more adversity physically to overcome being five foot 11. And not only did he make it into the NFL, he's been a premier performer franchise quarterback for probably almost 15 years now but his process watching his process was so inspiring to me because I I get impressed by people that achieve but I want to learn more about them before I say I I look up to them you know when I say I look up to people it doesn't necessarily mean I want to be like them sure. but I look up to them for some character trait or some ritual they have or some 
something that they do during the day on a consistent basis that I want to assimilate into my own routine, you know, yeah. whether, and it could be something as, as simple as how they treat other people, or yeah. it could be, you know, how they train or how they eat or, you know, how they run their business, how they're, how they lead. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, me being able to have the opportunity to come down here and, and speak with you. Yeah. Well, I learn different ways to get more out of my training, different things to get more out of my nutrition. Yeah, absolutely. But the other things that, that I was really most looking forward to coming down here is you are where I want to be in a year from now. Will I be there? No, but that's my goal to be able to have a team around me to help me level up my productivity. So I'm not spending time, um, you know, six hours answering Facebook messages. That's something that's super important to me, but in order for me to move the needle and, and continue to elevate my platform for impact, I can't, I can't hold on to the things that are holding me back. Sure. Like I love being able to interact with people on social media and answer their questions and send them a video reply back. They just, they get a kick out sure. of that and they remember that. And, and that's really special to me because I don't feel deserving that that makes people feel special. So it's hard for me to, to let go of that in order to build something bigger to impact more people. I love to be able to impact people one-on-one. -on -one. There's something just really intimate and special about that. But to be able to have the impact that a Dr. Oz has or a Tony Robbins has, I know that I need to, to fight that urge to, to be special to one person, to build the platform to be special to thousands and maybe millions of people. Sure, man. So what was it about Drew Brees' process that got you most excited though, that, that you that you The consistency. Because it wasn't, you know, I actually wrote down this question while Grant was speaking, and I wanted to ask both you guys this question. I'll answer your question with a question. During your tenure of, of a professional and, and your time as a college pro athlete, were you guys ever, like, disappointed when you experienced somebody else's process that you looked up to that, you know, you're like, you see their process, and you're like, it's, it's not that good. Like, they don't work that hard. To me, it was, like, frustrating. I'm like, I work so much harder than you. Why are you so much better than me? So I actually tell that story often, man. Growing up in Canada, it was a blessing and a curse. And that's often the irony of life, right? Sometimes your greatest blessing is your greatest curse and, and vice versa. And, you know, growing up in Canada, you're under the impression that you're at a disadvantage. You don't have exposure to as many people. Maybe you don't have access to certain things that people in the U.S. do. Cause, and, and people get this in Europe all the time. You think you're at a disadvantage, which is just not the truth. It makes you more unique. Well, here, here's the reality. So being in Canada, I was sheltered. I didn't get exposed to any pro athletes. I didn't get exposed to pro football players, pro uh, bodybuilders, anything like that. I had maybe some hockey players around, but that's a different breed altogether. So I had built my perception of what these athletes were in my mind, and I, I perceived them to be... The, the most badass, hardworking mofos on the planet. And I was like, man, if I want to get there, I have to work as hard or harder than every one of them. And that became my trademark, man. I just, everything I did, I crushed it. Like I, if someone came to the gym, I'm going to bury you. I don't care who you are. And I got to the point where I had two training partners, one for the first hour, one for the second <laughs> hour. And that's the truth, man, because that's what I believed it was going to take. That's awesome. That's what I believed it was going to take to get there. And then I moved to California, you know, a year after my uh, graduating university, graduating college. And I was looking around. I'm like, well, where's all the guys who are training hard? And not to take anything away from most professional bodybuilders, but the reality is that they don't train as hard as you'd think. They're not as committed dietarily as you think. They just happen to be the guys who respond a lot better. And that ended up being my greatest advantage. It was like, that's all I knew. Like, I just knew, like... I, but I, you had already developed. Yeah, I, I you, got But you way. had already developed the key. Yeah. And that's your work ethic. Because yeah. that's going to make you... That made you successful in, in bodybuilding. Right. It's making you successful as a leader of a company. And it's making you successful as, you know, financially as, uh, as an entrepreneur. Yeah. And looking back on it, I don't think that hard work, we talked about this too, the irony of hard work or maybe the paradox of hard work. I don't think hard work is always the right solution, uh, especially when you're going in the wrong direction. You know, you, but when you master that, yeah, you can and you couple that with like the knowledge of, of yeah. what you're teaching me in the way that's room, exactly and I put it, it with my, that's my exactly work ethic, it, right? I'm like, 
I'm unstoppable. Yeah. So, you know, it's the, it's the analogy of you can swing the hammer harder, but if you're not hitting the nail on the head, you're just causing a whole bunch of fucking damage. So when someone comes along, who's a, ma- good, who's a, a master analogy. carpenter and they teach you how to hit that nail on the head, all of a sudden you, you're able to hit a lot more ha- nails on the head. You can build your dream house, right? You get it done quicker. Right? Yeah. So that's the, that's the thing is like hitting, you know, working harder for most people is not the solution yet. You know, you, you got to learn how, where the, to, to point your effort in the right direction. And I think, you know, to answer your question, I was very, I was disappointed in a lot of guys. Some guys I was very impressed with aspects of their preparation. Sure. But Bits and far, pieces. And I feel like that's yeah. what I am. I'm a culmination of like sure. the different friends that I've had in my life. Like, you know, like you and the different people I rattled off earlier is I take bits and pieces. Like, I don't want to be the second best Ben Pakulski. I don't right. want to be the, the second best, you know, Michael Strahan or, or Dr. Oz or Bedros Koulian or, you know, any of these other world influencers i want to take two things about you yeah. two things about that person two things about that person and i want to systematically right. master them so then it becomes part of my own fabric right i guarantee you and i have a similar thought process on this is we both joined craig um valentine and bedros Koulian's mastermind for those of you out there it's an amazing mastermind and the reason i joined well i mean obviously they both have fantastically successful businesses but craig for me is the antithesis of me He's the most organized. And Pedro is like me. Right. So I'm like, God, if I surround myself with these guys and I learn more about their process, even if I take 20% of what, you know, the processes they have. Yeah. yeah. And that's how I became a pro bodybuilder, ironically, was I saw Marcus Rule and he's an ex pro bodybuilder. And I saw him literally signing autographs. He was sitting, you know, um, at a table signing pictures. And, sit, and he was resting his chin on his chest. His chest muscles were so developed. He was literally able to rest his chin on his chest. And I sat there, and I was probably 19 years old, 18 years old, and I sat there with my mouth open like, holy shit. If I can build a fraction of that, I could be a professional bodybuilder. And the same thing with Craig. I'm like, man, if I can just get a fraction of what he's got as far as his scheduling and his organizational skills and his diligence, then I can be a really, really successful entrepreneur. So how better than to, to achieve those skills that just surround yourself with? You are a very successful entrepreneur. Well, man, but like... <laughs> There's a, levels. A, a fraction. There's levels. Yeah, exactly. A fraction. When you talk about Tony Robbins, you talk about Dr. Draws, those are the levels we're aiming to, right? It's right, like, yeah. you, know, you guys know I was just at the Tony Robbins seminar this weekend, and I sat there as a student rather than a patient, if you, if you understand. Like, I see him as a therapist. And that's not to interrupt you, but I yeah. wanted to mention this because I yeah. think you're... Your listeners should know you're even more like humble and authentic in real life than even what you are on your podcast because I listen to this and I've seen all of your you know YouTube videos like certified I would say I'm six sliding them a fifty under the table <laughs> right now <laughs> hey, better make it a hundred I'm not done yet um, but but to to really really kind of go all in on on supporting you and. and and watching all of your stuff about six months ago because I discovered you were so much more than just a a bodybuilder. And I don't want to speak poorly on bodybuilding in general, but to me, bodybuilding in general is very similar to the fitness industry. I know we share that the same opinion that it's surface level. Yeah. You know, and a lot of the bodybuilders that, that I've met and I've, I've become friends with the sad reality is, is like, I don't want to surround myself with them. They're high achievers, but there's so many, so many things that they've been conditioned to do because of that industry that makes them unattractive as, you know, as a person that I want to surround myself with. And they're always, they're all attached to the end result. Right. It's a selfish industry, but even more than being a selfish industry, because I, I firmly believe like people don't want to hear this, listen to it right now. But in order for you to become the best in the world at anything, an entrepreneur, as, as a father, as, as a husband, anything, any achievement to become the best in the world, you're going to have to have some degree of selfishness because there's a lot of work that needs to be done in order to become the best in the world at something. And so you have to constantly be obsessed with what can I be doing right now to help me get closer to my goal. And so you're constantly thinking about yourself, right? You know, and that could be a good thing. If you're thinking, how can I improve myself to be more kind? Mm -hmm. How can I be improve myself to be um, more thoughtful to other people? Or, you know, what can I do right now to, to support one of my friends? Yep. You know, so it's, 
there's a balance of it, but there definitely must be a degree of selfishness. And that's why a lot of complaints and excuses that people make that I just don't have the, the time. I guarantee you I can help you find the time. Unplug your TV. Yeah. Put your phone down. How much time do you think you spend Way too on much. social media during yep. the day? That's my business. That's like the right. way that I'm able to bridge the gap in between myself and who I whose right. lives I want to touch. But in order to be able to do that, like I have to I have to invest time into it. It's the myth of balance, right? Is everybody says, Oh, you have to try to achieve balance. And you know, as a successful person in anything, you couldn't you can't be balanced. And that's that was the catalyst from your retiring from bodybuilding. It's like there's no I can't I can't be the best bodybuilder in the world and have three kids and have a business and still have a wife who doesn't want to kick me in the nuts. Like that's just the bottom line, right? So what something had to give. And for me, I had nothing left to prove in bodybuilding. Like yourself in football, you're like, man, I did it all. What else am I going to do? Win a couple more Super Bowls? Awesome. But I already did it. But it's, it's not, not going to change my life. It's not going to make me feel any better. Yeah, that's exactly it, man. That's, it's the myth of balance. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, that's the reality. So speaking to what you said, Craig Ballantyne's going to like, bring his name up again. He's the guy who taught me to create the not-to-do list. And that, to me, is the most simple, most profound thing in the world. Like, you talked about being selfish. Well... I find that, yes, time is extremely valuable and extremely scarce. But when you start creating those lists of, like, I don't do that, I don't do that, I don't do that, I don't do that. It's overwhelming. Freedom, man. Like, you get so much more time from not doing all the BS that you probably shouldn't be doing anyways, right? So for all of our listeners out there, I did an episode with Craig a couple months back now. And he's also got a Perfect Day Formula book, which everyone should read because it's awesome. I want to talk about um, your day-to-day routines because everyone's going to love hearing about how the hell you stay in such great shape and balance families and balance business. And uh, you talk about habits and habits of being, you know, for those of you guys that never seen Steve before, he walks around at 5% body fat and Grant walks around at 8 And uh, sorry, Grant, I had to throw under the bus. But he's he's way stronger than I am, though. Well, regardless, like that's, you know, that's not a fucking easy thing to do for anybody right like you know you pay attention to a lot of the stuff it's not just quote-unquote hard work um what are the habits that you think are most necessary to create success in your physical appearance in in the way you look and feel i think it starts with with the mental conditioning just like any anything else the first thing actually the last thing i do before i go to bed um is I will write my morning motivation. And the reason, I I, I would say this is my number one ritualistic routine for not success, but for prosperity. To me, prosperity is a combination of love and fulfillment, financial freedom and impact. You know, your your definition of prosperity is gonna be different than mine. It's gonna be different than the people that are listening to this right now. But I write down my morning motivation. For example, my morning motivation this morning, looking through my book. That's pretty awesome. You got it there. Good for you, man. Is, here we go. Monday morning, November 13th, 2017. In order to become the 1%, you must do what the 99% won't. Old ways won't open new doors. If you want more, do more. So it's just something really Is that something short. that came out of your brain or is that something that you... Um, Bits and pieces yeah. from everywhere. Yeah. You know, like some of them, I might just write a quote yeah. that's from Muhammad Ali or yeah. I might think of something and then and then write it down. But that routine that I have for myself of writing that down before I go to bed, it's the last thing that I do is Beautiful, I'll write man. that down and I'll, I'll read it in the same way when we were kids and we watched a scary movie and then we go to bed, we're, we're going to have nightmares. Yeah. So... I'm manifesting this thought into my life by reading it before I go to bed. And then the first thing I do when I wake up is I read it again. And so that is reinforcing the purpose that I have for the day, the mindset that I have for the day. And at the end of the day, that's why I call it the morning motivation, because I want my my mind subconsciously to manifest on that. So then I wake up in the morning. I'm not thinking about what my my mission or my purpose is high level right? because I've been thinking about it all night and I'm reminding myself in the morning and I would say, you want to talk about routine? I don't want to talk about anything else but my mindset because that's where it all begins. And so when I have my direction for the day and I'm waking up with with gratitude for just waking up, it doesn't matter what adversity you hit during the day, you're going to be able to handle it infinitely more efficiently when you when you come from a place of gratitude and thankfulness, like 
Example, you get a flat tire on your way to the gym or your way to a meeting and you're gonna be late and your schedule schedule for the whole day is screwed up because you mapped out every 30 minutes of your day for 14 hours and now this, this tire is gonna slow you down 30 minutes. It's gonna screw everything else up. That can be really overwhelming and depressing yeah. that you spent an hour and a half creating your schedule for the day. But when you come from a, a place of gratitude and thankfulness, you're like, okay, I've got a flat tire. I'm thankful that I have a freaking tire. And I've that I have a car attached it. to that sure. tire. That I have enough money to be able to buy another tire. Hell or yeah. the fact that, you know what, this could have sucked a whole lot worse. At least I'm around where a gas station is or et cetera, et cetera. So when you come from a place of gratitude and thankfulness, you're able to handle those things a whole lot better because you're not focusing on the negative. You're focusing on the things that you do have and you just need to make them better. And I think when you're grateful for your body, you're grateful for your life, your likelihood of eating shit or junk food is zero, like so much less decreased because you, you have such an appreciation for your body and for how much work you put in. And dude, the attitude of gratitude is everything, man. I love that you brought that up. Grant, what's your thing, man? What's your, um, your, your go-to? Grant's go got a good, he's yeah. got a good routine too. Yeah. Um, so I can't say I've done this for a really long time, but I'd say it was probably three or four months ago. <clears throat> I started noticing all the time I was late to everything. I was always late and it was because, and it wasn't because I just didn't care. It was because I was spending all my time like trying to get as much of the next thing done, thinking it would free up my time later on in the day. Uh, and what I realized is I was just spinning my wheels and I got to the end of the day and I was like, man, where'd the day go? Like I haven't achieved half of the stuff I thought I was gonna do. I've let five people down because I was late and I wasn't able to respect their time essentially and in my head I was always justifying it because you know taking it back to a certain level of that you have to be selfish but it, I wasn't it's not that I was being selfish I wasn't being efficient so what I started doing is charting out my entire next day down to the 15 minute increments um, literally starting at 3 a.m. Not that I wake up every day at 3 a.m., but from 3 a.m. all the way to 2.45 a.m. Scheduling REM sleep. Yeah. And, well, well <laughs> scheduling literally everything. So, yeah. uh, you know, kind of going back to what you said is when I started doing that, I started cutting out all the unnecessary bullshit that I just don't need to have occupy my day. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I would fill in the constants that I always have, no matter what, I'm going to eat my meals every day. So that, there's the health aspect of it. Um, I know I'm going to go to the gym and train every day. So, and I always know that's going to be about 90 minutes. So I know I need to allot that time in there. So you fill all those out. And from there, I, and instead of going on to the things I wanted to do every day, I went into the goals that I had, or what was my goal to achieve every day. And I started realizing that micro goals would completely outweigh the macro goals. And you know, you want to talk about business, entrepreneurship, in the gym. Everyone focuses on that end goal instead of the process, which is the micro goals. And you're never going to get to that end result if you don't stop and enjoy and capitalize on those small micro goals along the way. Twofold, one, you're not going to actually achieve them. And two, you're never going to be able to give yourself the praise that you actually do need along the way and say, I am achieving something. I am doing this the right way. Uh, I achieved this today because you end up feeling like a failure if you don't achieve that goal you have for a year from now for the next 12 months. Right. You don't have anything each month to say, okay, I'm moving towards it. You just see that you're not there yet. So started doing that. And then if I do have free time in the day, you know, a, a, a big thing to me and I know Steve is family is it's huge. Um, I have no desire to achieve all the things I want in life by yourself and get to the top and not have anyone to share it with. Yeah. Good for you, man. That's awesome. Uh, I know everyone's going to be pissed off at me if I don't bring up um, evening routines and nutritional habits. So I want to go there for each of you guys. Uh, for me, the evening routines, um, I I failed here. Um, You're not a sleeper. Well, I'm not a sleeper um, from a health standpoint, but from a consistent presence for my family. I'm not what I want to be right now because, you know, we're talking about balance right yeah. now. The the reason that that I went to Grant and and wanted him to be part of my team is I wanted to continue to move the needle and, and grow and scale our our platform for impact. And I was willing to to make a financial commitment to him to be able to accomplish this because I I'm noticing my kids getting older and I'm noticing that my impact in other people's lives is certainly growing and my brand is growing and my business is growing and my income is growing and my freedom is growing. 
but not my not my true freedom. Like my financial freedom, I can go buy whatever I want or live yeah. wherever I want or take vacations whenever I want. But I want the freedom of, you know what? From five o'clock to 7.30 every single day, I'm gonna be with my family. I'm not gonna touch my phone. People, I don't want to be reached. That is the, t- the, the, the time that I want a time block for my family. I don't want to spend time with them. I want to invest time with them. Yeah. If I'm invested in my family, that means there's no phones, there's no TVs. If we're playing Candyland on the floor, that's that's investing time yeah. because I'm nurturing the relationship that I have with my three daughters or my son or my wife or my good friends like Grant. That's the the return on that investment is is growing a deeper relationship with them and actually getting to know them better versus well, I'm, I'm going to be home from 5 o'clock to 7.30, but if you guys need me, you know, any of my employees, call me. Yeah. No. Yeah. I want to get to where they know from 5 o'clock to 7.30, don't even bother because I'm, I'm invested in what's truly important. I'm trying to keep the main thing the main thing. And that's a constant struggle for me because the greatest impact I'll ever have in this lifetime is, is in my family. Yeah. And that's really, really important to me. But I constantly have to to fight the urge to be present for other people while I scale my mission but be be present for my wife and for my kids it's it's a struggle that I'm losing right now sure. you know but I I'm, I'm vigilant you go with phases, it man. It goes and, I'm, in cycles. and I'm self-aware to the fact that there's an inadequacy as far as I'm concerned um, for my fulfillment and my role that I have as a mm-hmm. leader in my family. Dude, I do the same thing five to eight every day. And it's funny last night. And, and here's why it matters is because last night, you know, we sat down on the floor, literally in front of the, in, in the living room and we played a game of monopoly on the floor. And you start to realize that your character traits are either going to be coming through in your kids or not. And if your character, if they're developing other character traits that aren't maybe consistent with your beliefs or maybe they're, they're something that makes you unhappy. It's not their fault. It's yours. Yeah. You're not present. And I noticed that yesterday, like, you know, my son was literally just lying about what was happening where he refused to like pay when he landed on someone else's property. It's so, it's so obscure, but I was like, gosh, how did he pick this up? I mean, it obviously tells me he's spending more time with someone than me, someone else. It's maybe it's a teacher. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a kid at school, whatever it is. But you know, and I need to spend more time with him to make him realize, like, hey, man, you need to, like, is hold it your more feet time or is it being more present? No, this, that's the thing. When I'm there, man, my phone is off. My, I'm, like, I'm present. But we don't always get time, like, and diversity of, of interactions, right? So, you know, when him and I are together, we're either in the pool, we're playing catch, we're playing dodgeball, or we're playing hockey or something, right? So it's always like sports, it's always competitive, it's always a little bit rough. We're wrestling, we're running, we're going for a walk. It's always very physical. But there isn't a lot of like mental interaction. Like we read together every night, but um, you know, a diverse type of um, interaction so that he gets to see how I act in different scenarios or how he should act in different scenarios, right? Like, um, so maybe someone's just been influencing him in this particular area, and he has this desire to to lie. And I was like, hey man, I don't understand. Like, I saw you know, and and most parents would get mad, like, why are you lying? You're not a liar. But I'm like, no, this is my limitation as a dad that I haven't spent enough time interacting in those places. So, I mean, speaking of that, dude, I'm in the exact same place you are. It's just two to three hours a day is not a lot when you break it down the big picture, you know? Yeah, I mean, if you do that every weekday, yeah. I mean, that's really, if I do two hours every week, that's only 10 hours. Yeah. You know, like, they they deserve that. Sure. You know, and for me, it's funny that you said that the the time that you're spending with your kids is, is fun time and you're enjoying going on walks or, you know, playing basketball or doing physical things. Like I'm the opposite because I know that I'm, I'm not investing enough time. And especially with my son, I feel like the time that I do spend with him, I'm always like mentally or physically coaching him instead of, I need to have more time where it's just like, let's just go swim. Let's just go have fun. Right. Because I know the time that I have with him is, is really limited and I want to help him become the he's man. He's older though, right? He is, yeah, he's yeah. he's gonna be nine in like okay. a week, yeah. or he'll be ten in a week. So he's the oldest, and so I'm I'm constantly trying to to help mold him sure. instead of just just spending time with him. Like right. he he misses, uh, as far as from from a father standpoint, he he misses just fun time, just yeah. fooling around because all the time that I spend with him, I see so much potential in him. And I see so much of myself in him. Like he's got extreme ADHD, but he is such a kind person. Um, and I pride myself in that as well. 
and he's very athletic. And so he's got all the, the things that are innately um, either developed in myself or just something that, that genetically I have, a predisposition to, to being happy. Mm-hmm. He's got those things. So I spend too much time coaching him instead of being his friend a little bit more, you know, and sure. just having fun. You yeah. know, I understand as a father, I'm not supposed to be your friend. I'm supposed to be your teacher and the leader of the family. But I do that 90% of the time, and then there's 10% of the time it's just like, let's go ride dirt bikes. Yeah, yeah. Grant, so, you know, I believe you two are, are as Steve said, in the 1%, um, you know, compared to the 99%. What's one of the, you know, life hacks to you as a common term these days that, that you think sets you apart from everybody else and allows you to live that physical life that is ahead of 99% of the population of the world? I think the biggest thing is figuring out whatever works for you. Um, you know, I could, I could take advice from you. I could take your tips, your ideas, your concepts, but those might not be perfect for me, but I can take little bits and pieces from yes, those. Yes, they would, Grant. All of them. <laughs> 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 but everybody's different, you know. Um, you know, through the program, you know, that just came out, it's the biggest thing about it is, you know, it doesn't matter if you like to get on a treadmill, if you like to go hiking, if you like to jump on your bed, if you like to jump on a trampoline or just do straight cardio all day, every day. Right you got to make it work for you because that's the best plan that's going to work. Right. So, uh, you know, nutritionally for me, one of my big things is that I, I, I was a cook when I was really young. I started cooking in a restaurant. It was really bizarre how it happened. He's a wonderful cook. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that went on for six years, and I learned a lot of really incredible things. At the time, it wasn't important to me. I didn't think nutritional-wise about that. Sure. I mean, I was 10 to 16 years old. Uh, but now, you know, within the last couple of years, I learned how to start taking – essentially like meals that I love to eat, like chicken Parmesan, my favorite thing. But how can I take that and make it into something healthy? How can I, how can I manipulate something that isn't necessarily right for me, but make it work for my lifestyle? Right. And you do that and you realize that this whole fitness thing, it, it doesn't have to be a grind every day. It's enjoyable. You, you just have to figure out how to make it enjoyable to your life as opposed to, man, they said I have to wake up. I have to, I have to go be a lion in the gym. I have to, you know, be a beast, an animal, this, you know, be a unicorn, be yeah. something totally different, be outlandish, stand apart from everyone else and be your own thing and don't be afraid of it. So dude, I love that you said that because one of the things that I teach, and this is kind of a recent teaching, a recent realization for me is as we spoke about in the, in the gym today, athletes are always attached to the external result, the external stimulus. I need to run faster. I need to jump higher. I need to lift more weight. As, as someone who's trying to improve their body, our focus needs to be what's the internal response we're getting, right? The internal result. So when you talk about cardio, when you talk about, um, you know, any type of exercise, really, all people are trying to do, and people don't realize this, all you're trying to do is create a certain internal response, whether it be CrossFit, kettlebells, TRX, jogging, running, lifting weights. You're just trying to create a very specific internal environment to get a sp- to get a result, right? So what's your what's your desired objective? I'm trying to lose body fat or I'm trying to build muscle. Well, that, that's a very specific internal environment you're trying to create. So, so many people are attached to the external vehicle when they should be more attached to the internal response. And that's such a simple concept, but it doesn't fucking matter if you're doing a kettlebell or if you're doing a treadmill or you're doing a, a whatever, a kip up. It's, it's what you're trying to, what internal response you're trying to elicit. So am I trying to elicit a neurological or a strength response to make me faster or stronger? Am I trying to elicit a hypertrophy response and make my muscles bigger? Am I trying to elicit a metabolic or a fast, fat loss response? Which one is it? And forget about the external vehicle, man. Just attach to the internal mechanism. So that's so simple. But like when, when you break it down for people like that, they're like, oh, that's really easy. Like, it, so it doesn't matter, right? And, and that I love that you said it's just about what makes you happy to do it. Because ultimately, if you're on the treadmill and you're fucking pissed off, it's going to be a way different internal environment than if you're outside swinging a kettlebell and you're happy about it. Like, that's what you love doing, right? So attaching yourself to, well, I really like this. I'm just, I know I'm just trying to create this internal response. So who really cares what the vehicle is as long as it makes me happy? Because that's so important, right? Because if you're stressed out, out cortisol's up. It doesn't matter if you're spending an hour in the treadmill. It matters because your internal re- result, response is going to be different, right? Well, I think so much of that goes back to everything we've been talking about is the number one thing that I think everybody needs to do in every aspect of their life. And this is just my opinion, but define what your goal is. Yeah. And half of the problem is when you don't define what your goal is, you're, you're, you're kind of like trying to achieve a destination without a map. 
and you don't know your exact process for how you want to get there. You just know you want to get there, and that's great. You know, having a goal is awesome, but unless you truly define it, you don't know what you're going to do to get there. So, for instance, right. people that you know, I have guys come up to me in the gym sometimes, and they're like, "Man, I need to, I need to gain weight." Well, why do you need to gain weight? Right. Well, because I want to gain muscle. So why do you have to gain weight? Right. Yeah, that, you know, if you if you get if you're just going to put on sloppy weight, that doesn't equate to muscle. It doesn't right. mean you're going to be stronger. So let's figure out what your goal is in the smartest, most efficient way. Let's work smarter instead of harder to achieve your goals. Ah, right. Isn't that the amazing thing? And the reality is, most people flip flop or they or they have conflicting goals. You know, like I want to gain muscle and I want to lose fat and I want to learn how to do you know CrossFit and like all these other things. But the re- the way you guys became great at what you do is you mastered something you, you, like, Hey man, I'm going to be the best football player that I can be. And that was your exclusive goal. And that's how you become good at something is mastery. Right. And most people just, how many guys, you know, and you guys run into this every day. It's like one, one week guy wants to build as much muscle as possible. And then he starts getting a little bit of weight and he goes, fuck this. I got to lose some body fat. Cause I gotta, I gotta go to, to this party this weekend or something. Right. And like you say, man, people just always are just shifting their goals and, and they don't have a clear enough end result in mind. So it shifts, you know, from this to that. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the times, um, you know, we're, we've been talking about setting goals, chasing goals, achieving goals, and I think the the number one dream killer is, you know, we talk about find something that you love, but even even when you're doing something you love and you're passionate about and you think you're living in your purpose, you still have to get outside of your comfort zone. Hell yeah. Like, it's not just do something that you love and you're going to be successful, it's Find what you love because getting outside of your comfort zone and growing is going to be so much easier and more enjoyable when it's something that you love. Because in order to become the best at it, you're going to have to do it over and over and over and over again. And then you're going to have to recalibrate and keep doing it over again. And you're never going to master it. Like you said, you you guys have perfected this or mastered this craft. I haven't mastered anything. Right but I have mastered the process. Mm -hmm. Like I know exactly what is required for achievement. Identifying your vision, creating micro goals, you know, detailing out a plan. And then the last step is, is just executing it. And that's where 90% of people are going to fail in making their dream, their everyday reality, because everybody can identify what their dream is and everybody can set a couple goals on the way to achieving that dream. Right. And you can get help creating your plan, but there's nowhere to hide. And executing you can't hire people to pay the price for you right man i love that you brought that up because I, I you said that everybody you think everybody knows what their dream is and i don't actually think that's true i meet tons of people who say man how do i find out what i really want to do how do i find out what my passion is and that's true you that's kind of not really in our wheelhouse because we're like well i just i just knew i wanted to do that we're living in our purpose right yeah now. yeah and i think for me i, I kind of came to the realization that for most people It's you have to seek the obstacles. You have to seek the biggest challenges and the ones that seem like the smallest amount of work, the the ones that you actually enjoy suffering through Mm -hmm. become your passion. Like you're like, oh, fuck, that that really wasn't that bad. I actually really enjoyed that suffering. Mm -hmm. Oh, maybe that's what I love to do. You know, until until you really learn to suffer, man, like you'll never find your true passion. And so many people go through life, unfortunately, just never finding it because they never put themselves in that place to They're like... They're scared to take risks, though. Dude, if you as do something... As cliche as that sounds. If you do something and it sucks and you hate it, don't fucking do it again. Right. If, you, if you do something and it sucks and you're like, man, I kind of like that. Like, it kind of made me feel really good. Well, maybe that's a hint, right? Right, and, and that's one of the reasons that I've become um, as involved in the different communities that I've lived in in different NFL cities and, you know, the, the number one place has been, you know, New Jersey and New York, because I've been there for 10 years. And so developing the different things through my foundation to become not a part of the community, but become entrenched in the community and and really like give myself as, as a servant to other people in that community, whether that's, you know, taking kids shoe shopping um, that can't afford shoes before school goes back um, into swing or, you know, identifying, um, high school seniors that can't afford to go to their senior prom and taking care of tuxedos and hair and nails and limos Dude, and dinner. That's awesome. But then I actually get to go to the prom. <laughs> um, I've I've done so I, I've done several things like that and and it costs money and it costs time. Sure. But to be able to to do that and then know that 
because of my hard work and and the financial blessings that I've earned through through hard work and sacrifice, I'm able to kind of take those blessings, those those financial blessings, and utilize them to give you know a 17 or 18 year old girl that might have low self esteem and come from a a, a rough upbringing, you know. Yeah. Maybe she's adopted or maybe, you know, her, her parents have drug issues or whatever the case may be, she, she's got it raw. And for me to be able to take the hard work and the financial blessings in my life and not only, you know, let her know that she matters and, and give her a night to be beautiful, you'll never have another opportunity to experience a senior prom. And that's the, that's the, the culmination of all your childhood friendships and all the adversity that you've gone through up until that point. And this is the last kind of hurrah for you to launch yourself into adulthood. Right. And for some of these, you know, young women or, or men to not experience that because of something in their life that they had no control over breaks my heart. And right. so I've, I've been to like, I think this year will be my 15th prom <laughs> and uh, it gets better every year. The older I get, the more the, the more fun prom becomes sure. because if the principal comes up to me and tells me to stop dancing on the table like dude i i could do what i want i'm probably <laughs> older than you <laughs> i love that you're doing that man so part of my supplement line that you guys know i'm launching is um, a dollar of every product sale is going to go to help underprivileged kids because ultimately man like money for me is i want to make money but money for me is not the biggest driving factor like i don't need to make hundreds of millions or billions of dollars for me like for what right like what do i need but what motivates me is like I want to be able to help There's all these kids. a lot of other people in the yeah, you know man. what I mean? I'm like, yeah, I want to help kids. I want to help kids who are underprivileged or maybe kids that are sick. And you know, like I, we both had very blessed upbringings. I came from a very um, middle class, lower middle class, maybe middle class family. Um, but I still had everything I ever wanted. I still had to play sports. I still so got to food, eat every you know? meal. Yeah. yeah. So nothing to complain about, man. But, like, there's kids out there that don't. And now that I have my own kids, man, it's just it, I couldn't imagine not having a meal or not having shoes or not having the opportunity to go to school or play sports or, like, so that that to me is my motivation, man. So I love that you brought that up. And, uh, man, Armageddon and 30-day metabolic reset. Tell people about that. Um, yeah, so, th honestly, the, the first thing I did after, you know, retiring from a 10-year NFL career, at the end of every NFL season – I would kind of self-scout myself the same way, you know, you would have a bodybuilding competition. And after you're done with the bodybuilding competition, you would get the opinion of people that you value. But you would also want to watch the video to, you know, to optimize your um, posing routine, analyze your body, and try to identify a weakness and improve it for the next show. It's the same way I would... As, as a football player, I would you watch the small. games on Monday morning and figure out what I did right and, and reinforce that and try to burn it into my brain, but then identify what I did poorly, figure out why I did it poorly, and, and try to improve it for the next game that's coming up in six days. I would do that at the end of every season, you know, review the goals that I had for the season, review, you know, whether or not I achieved them. And if I, I did, hey, great job. Now let's set some new goals. And if I didn't, identify the the genesis, the reason that I did not achieve them. And so after I finished my 10th season, I reviewed goals, you know, lifetime goals, season goals, um, athletic goals, and every single goal that I wrote down for myself for the next calendar year, not one of those had anything to do with football. And so I was kind of blown away because that had always been part of my goals, you know, achievement in athletics. So I looked at my wife and, you know, we met with our financial planner. I'm like, can I retire? And they're like, theoretically, yes, but you know, you're going to make, you know, $2.2 .2 million next year. Why would you walk away from five months of work? I'm like, cause I don't think that $2.2 .2 million is going to enrich my life as much as me starting to pursue my true passion in life and, and the legacy that I want to build. And, and it's kind of like the old biblical parable, you know, and God blesses, um, three different people with X amount of, of skills. If you bury your gifts in the, in the ground and don't share them with people and don't develop them, 
then they're going to rot and they're going to go away. But for somebody that's given gifts and he nurtures them and develops them into skills and uses those skills to bless other people, the same way I feel as if I've taken my NFL career and blessed other people philanthropically, or maybe it's just social media by blessing people with my, my time and attention and, and letting them know that there's somebody out there that truly does want them to win. Yeah. When you do that, life has so much more meaning and it's not the car you drive, the watch you have on the wrist, the, you know, square footage of your home or the friends that you have. It's things that you can't see that mean so much more the impact that you have in somebody else's life. You impact so many people that you don't even know. Like you had no idea that, you know, that your social media content or your YouTube videos or your podcast impacted my life. You had no idea who I was. You'd never even heard of me, but that's cool. Yeah. You know, because that reminds me, I might be impacting somebody that, that I've never met before and I'm drawing them into my ecosystem, not because of um, football achievements, but rather the, the way that I attack you know, my inadequacies, my right. weaknesses, and also the way that I'm able to kind of be vulnerable and share those failures on social media. Cause it's really easy for people to look at you or Grant or myself or any other people that are, you know, on Instagram or social media, and you're only seeing the, the highlights of their life. Yeah. It's the Instagramification, you know, it's a word that you and I, or you said about five or six days ago when we were on the phone, I'm like, I'm definitely going to use that because Social media has become such a staple for people. They spend more time and attention into social media than they do developing relationships in their own life yeah. because they want to they wanna see what other people are doing in their own life. And so that's another balance fight that I have because I'm not constantly comparing myself to other people, but I am constantly looking what other people are doing. Sure. And then without me really knowing it, I'm comparing that to what I'm currently doing and I feel like they're doing so much more. You know, they're impacting so many more people. And so I guess it's a good way of comparing, but at the same time, I need to stay in my own lane and I need to focus on me because more than likely what I'm seeing on Instagram is like the highlight of their month or day or it And they a, set it up and took a hundred exactly, selfies. And dude, exactly. the reality of our, the world we live in is everybody's comparing themselves to a dream. They're comparing themselves to you know, not other people's lives. And some of this stuff is not even real. It's like it's photoshopped 50 different ways and the lighting is perfect. You're yep. like, oh, he's so lean or he does this or he does that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He doesn't look like that all the yeah, time. So it's know? giving people unreasonable expectations of what, what's possible for themselves. And, and that's why the fitness dreams. industry is a joke. I completely agree with you, man. I completely agree with you. So all we're trying to do, the three of us in this room collectively, we're trying to empower men and women with a simple process and with some inspiration and motivation to, to take control of I feel lives. like that's my true value that's that I can give to people. It, it's not man. a training program. Yeah, I feel really confident in the training programs because I don't ever create a training program that I don't go through myself sure. or I didn't develop myself. But at the end of the day, I know that that training program is going to give them the plan that they need and their vision. If they're purchasing a program or coming into my member's website, their vision is to become better, you know, more fit, you know, leaner, stronger, more well-rounded, more athletic. That's how I attract them. But the real value that I feel like I can give people that they can't get many other places is, is the, the mindset, the mentality, the thankfulness, the perspective, the, the ability to control your perspective. And then once they apply those into their life, training programs, like what you do when you're in the gym is not nearly as important as how you live your life when you live, right. when, when you leave the gym. I'll tell you what, man, from my external perspective of you, just being a good person. So uh, you may have experienced this too. Growing up for me, and I'm not taking anything away from professional bodybuilding, I sound like a huge dick, but the reality is I didn't feel like I had a good role model in bodybuilding. Everybody is very hard. Everybody's very uh, angry. Everybody's very, you know, however they happen to be. I didn't have a good role model, man. So for people to look up at you as an ex-NFL player, as a guy who's currently fit, awesome shape, who has a great family, who always has a smile on his face, always has a positive outlook, that in itself, man, shifts the paradigm of millions and millions of men around the world and gives them someone to look up to. So please keep doing it, both you guys, because that, to me, honestly, from my external perspective, teaching people what muscle is cool. That's going to get their first attention, like you say. But um, giving people a positive role model is so much more impactful than you realize, even for me. So I'm grateful, man. Thank you. No, I, dude, I, I, I appreciate you, man. And, and it's not 
not your achievements. And you talked about it earlier. You know, like the more layers of, of Ben that I pull back, like the more, I want more people to, to know about you. Not like, I want to come on your podcast. Like I want to know how I can further support you and elevate you because Likewise, I truly Likewise. believe, Thank I truly you. believe in, in what you do, what you say, how you operate and your integrity and your character. And so you're talking about, you know, the, the kind words that you just said to, to grant myself, um, I had two phone calls in the past four days that, that really kind of almost kind of shocked me. You know, I had, um, had a text message I got from Andy Frisella, the motherfucking CEO, um, first form. And, um, you know, he just had like such insanely kind things to say about me as a person, not like, Hey, congratulations on the muscle fitness cover or congratulations on this. But really the, the conversation that we had was the day before you called me and we hammered, hammered our plans for here. But the, the compliments that he gave me and, and the encouragement that the way that I'm doing things, not what I'm doing, but the way that I am pursuing my goals, he's like, man, don't ever change because people, people in this industry aren't doing it the right way yes, and they're, they're and they're winning. Yep. But yes, you're right. doing it the right way and you're winning, you know, so keep doing that because there's, you know, you're a unicorn. Which to me, like that's, I, I actually wrote that down earlier because you had said something in, in Grant and I, and you can see on my phone, like I have a pink unicorn on the case of my phone. And the reason I do that is just the constant reminder yeah. that how many unicorns, you know, are around. Unicorns are rare. Unicorns are not something you see every day. Yeah. They're special. That's what I want to be. I don't want to be a beast. I don't want to be a savage. I want to be a freaking unicorn. There's <laughs> lots of beasts and lots like of savages. It. Yeah. How many unicorns do you know out there? Right. Men are never going to refer to themselves as a unicorn because that's not tough. It's not strong. It's not alpha. Right. It's special. Right. You know what I mean? I want to be special. I don't want to be alpha. I like it. I like it. All right, gents. I really appreciate your time. I hope everybody loved this. Um, What's the Instagram handle and website people can find you at? Uh, At Weatherford5 for Twitter for uh snapchat for instagram my facebook is um i think it's facebook.com backslash official steve weatherford um and then same thing on youtube but yeah if anybody out there listening right now has any questions um it could be about anything we spoke about today or it could be something that you're just wondering in general and you've never heard of me before ask them you know send me a direct message on instagram because that's that's truly something that I really, really enjoy is that one-on-one interaction. And I'm still very, very involved in, in doing that. Um, and it's special to me. So it's, I feel it is an honor and a, and a privilege for somebody um, to think highly enough of me to, to take the time and, and attention required to ask a question. And that's the reason that Grant and I work together because we share the same ideals, the same vision, the same purpose. And, um, you know, he's one of the hardest workers I know. Sweet. So, and I'm going to link to all that stuff in the show notes at bempakoski.com slash podcasts. And Steve's also going to give you guys a discount to his membership site, which is the 30 day metabolic reset program where he literally gets in there, him and Grant get in there and do uh, all the programs yeah. literally one yeah. by we're gonna one. Film, we're going to film a couple more exercises, which after is this ridiculous. Podcast, so. um, and we, I mean, that's, that's, we're very, very grateful for what you guys do. So, boys, thank you very much for your time Appreciate and you. all, you. all that you're doing. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that podcast. Thank you very much for listening. Head on over to iTunes right now and leave me a review. Let me know if you loved it. Let me know if you absolutely hated it. Either way, I need to know so I can improve my job uh, and bring you guys the best information with respect to muscle building health optimization, and building a better person, building a better man. Um, So thank you very much to our sponsors, which make this stuff possible. Um, I'd love for you guys to each head over and check out atplab.com, ATP Labs or ATP Lab. Either one works. Um, ATP is a company I've recently aligned with because they have world-class manufacturing and everything they do is third-party tested and proven to be what it is inside the bottle that it says it is on the label. And you guys know that's massive. And not only that, we're getting the best quality ingredients from anywhere in the world that provides them. 
thank you also to Prime Fitness USA, um, the best equipment for someone looking to build muscle and make the most of their time. Um, I chose to reach out to Prime personally. They never reached out to me. I reached out to them because I knew what they had, and I really believed in their product, and I brought every one of their pieces into my gym, and we still use them every day because, you know, we're all about mindful attention to detail. We are muscle intelligence. We are the ones teaching the best people in the world, the smartest people in the world, how to build muscle in the least amount of time. Uh, another shout out to Gasp and Better Bodies for always taking great care of myself and my trainers and my staff. If you guys want to get a discount for Gasp Better Bodies, head over to bambukolsky.com slash podcasts and check out the show notes from this show and all of the other shows and you can find transcripts there as well. So have a wonderful day, upgrade your life, stay focused and live a life of greatness. Join us on BenPokolsky.com to learn the cutting-edge techniques to take control of your body, your brain, and create your greatest life.